Hello, my name is Carissa Klein. I'm a researcher at the University of Queensland focused on applied marine conservation planning with a special interest in integrated land sea planning. Now today I'm going to provide a brief overview of a couple of approaches to prioritizing actions that address land and sea-based threats to marine ecosystems, often referred to as integrated land sea planning or ridge to reef planning. Each integrated land sea planning prioritization approach addresses different types of connections important between the land and sea. I will discuss a few existing planning approaches to give you an idea of what can be done, but keep in mind that these approaches are not one size fits all, and none of them address all types of connections important between the land and sea. In Hugh Possingham's lectures, he emphasized the importance of setting a clear objective in systematic conservation planning. Applied to land sea planning, there are two general types of objectives, threat-based and outcome-based objectives. Now, a threat-based objective aims to reduce the amount of threat, such as runoff of nutrients and overfishing, to a marine ecosystem or species. And an outcome-based objective aims to maintain or improve the state or the health of a marine ecosystem or species through the reduction of threats. Although outcome-based objectives are typically desired, they require more data, assumptions, and or modeling than threat-based objectives, which is often prohibitive. An outcome-based objective requires an understanding of how the type and quantity of threats impact a marine ecosystem, which is often informed using a process model that predicts the impact of each action in each place on the land or sea on the relevant marine ecosystem. A threat-based objective simply requires information about how much threat a particular action abates. Now I will discuss more tangible examples of each type of objective from a few studies that we have done in the tropics. First, an example of a threat-based objective. This study was done across several ecoregions in the Coral Triangle, threatened by both land and sea-based human activities. The idea was to develop an approach that can inform investment decisions across a large region. This region and many other regions are part of large multilateral conservation initiatives that are faced with deciding how and where to spend money for conservation. This objective was to maximize threat reduction to coral reefs through investment in land and sea-based conservation actions across the ecoregions shown here in the black polygons. In this study, we took it a step further and defined an outcome-based objective. So rather than just focusing on reducing threat, we are focused on how the reduction of threats impacts coral reefs. The objective was to maximize coral reef condition through investment in marine and terrestrial protected areas. This required the development of a coral reef condition model that allowed us to predict how changes in forest cover and fishing effort impacted coral reefs across all of Fiji. This work was used to inform decisions in Fiji about the location of terrestrial protected areas. To solve the objectives of the previous two case studies, we used an approach called return on investment, which is commonly used in business and economics to make efficient investment decisions. You may not know it, but we all use it to make decisions when we go shopping. At the grocery store, for example, you're using it to figure out how you can feed your family healthy, balanced food for the least cost. Essentially, it helps you determine what conservation actions on the land or sea give you the most for your money. It has been used in many places around the world to help inform conservation decisions to do with threatened species management. In order to implement this approach in land sea planning, there are a few general steps. So other than defining your conservation objective, which is the first threat, the next thing you're going to do is list all the different threats impacting the particular marine ecosystem that is under consideration. The next step is looking at and making a long list of all the different actions or the different projects that you could do to abate each of these threats. And those actions could be different in different places uh, depending on what's relevant in that particular region. The next step is estimating the economic cost of implementing each of those actions. So how much is it going to cost to implement or manage each of those actions or projects? And finally, what we do is bring all this information together to make investment decisions. So what we do for each action is we calculate which one gives us the most benefit per dollar spent in terms of how to achieve our conservation objective. 
Now these two studies focused on prioritizing conservation actions that deliver the most benefit to coral reef ecosystems per dollar spent. There are many other types of problems faced in integrated land-sea conservation planning that are solved using different approaches. For example, in some cases like Fiji, there's a desire to ensure that marine and terrestrial protected areas are adjacent to each other to facilitate important ecological processes that rely upon intact marine and terrestrial ecosystems. For example, many freshwater fish, crustaceans, and mollusks found on tropical high islands migrate across freshwater and saltwater habitats throughout their life cycles. Their migration across habitat boundaries is affected by human disturbance causing habitat destruction and changes to hydrological flow. Thus, it is important to protect adjacent terrestrial, freshwater, and marine habitats to ensure this and other ecological processes can persist. The objective of this particular study was to prioritize marine reserves close to catchments upstream with high forest cover in order to facilitate ecological processes that rely upon intact land-sea protected area connections. This is an example of an outcome-based objective as it aims to ensure ecological processes can persist. We developed an approach for doing this using the MarkSAN systematic conservation planning software where we aim to not only protect 20 to 30 percent of each marine and terrestrial habitat in a protected area, we preferentially prioritized marine reserves adjacent to catchments with high forest cover. These priority areas are shown here in red, where the small little hexagons are the coral reefs and then the big polygons are catchments in a major island in Fiji. So in summary, there's a variety of approaches that can be used in integrated land sea planning and it depends on the objective to determine what approach you use. So really what you want to do is set a clear quantifiable objective as the first step and then decide an approach you're going to use. For additional examples of integrated land sea planning, please read the review by Alvarez Romero in Annual Review in Ecology, Evolution and Systematics. I'm happy to email you a copy if you don't have access. Further, I provide a knowledge acquisition moment to further explore other objectives that can be addressed in integrated land-sea conservation planning using the Great Barrier Reef as an example. Thank you.